It was built between 1801 and 1803 for George Reed II, who was the son of a Delaware signer of both the Declaration of Independence and Constitution, and who incidentally uh, lived right next door to where this house was constructed. George Reed II was a lawyer just like his father, mm -hmm. um, so he did follow in his father's footsteps in that respect, but he probably fully intended to hold public office as well. He just never rose to the same stature that his father did within the state, though he did hold several um, local offices within the city of Newcastle. He was quite a prominent citizen within his city. It's uh, 22 rooms, about 14,000 square feet of living space. So it was, it was quite an amazing structure when it was built. Um, it's often referred to as monumental, and even on the street now, it really does tower above the neighboring ho houses, which by and large were built um, after this house was built. So even then, um, it was quite something to see on the street. He went through uh, a series of different phases, and then he finally came across um, uh, a gramophone. It was a wonderful machine, but it needed some improvements. One of the feedback that he got was that the horns were big and unsightly and they collected dust. So he decided, you know, how can we combat this fact of them being big and unsightly and collecting dust? And so he put them in a decorative wooden case, which became the Victrola. Now, by putting a horn in the decorative wooden box, there was an added benefit that came to this, and that was by opening these doors, now you, for the first time, have some element of volume control. This is the Water Street Station, which was a combination of a freight office and a passenger station. When you look at a furnace building, it's what he does with a roof line. And it, we can almost see it here, but there are five distinct pieces of that roof line. There's this western end, including the little two-story stair tower. And then there's an indented piece, and then there's a broader piece, and then there's a single-story piece on the end. There, there's really five of them. All of the roofs get truncated in one direction or another. That's the first thing about him. If you look at that chimney up there, that is the original 1887 chimney, and you can see how sculptural it is at the top, even with the little slots in the side and the brickwork. Everything had a decoration to it. The other thing Furnace did, you, you can stand here and count the number of different windows in this building. You know, just real quickly, one, two, three, four, five, six, a bay window, I mean, just incredible variety to all these architectural details, which have function of getting light into the building, but they also make the building just look really interesting. We never got to play in the majors, but on the basis of our records in the Negro League, the selection committee of the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, they decided to make things right by voting some of us into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was only the, the sixth Negro Leaguer ever inducted into the Hall of Fame. Satchel Page was the first in 1971, and Judy was the sixth in 1975. And so he finally got his due, due recognition that way. Once I got to Cooperstown, and I seen all these people running to see this man called Judy, and I would just stand back out of the way and said, let me see who this man is. And that's when it really dawned on me the type of a ball player he had been. And, and how people were seeking his autographs and just wanted to take his picture and a lot of people just wanted to shake his hand. And I, then I realized, I said, I'm in the company of a gentleman. To think what that man saw and what he could have imparted would be priceless, you know? And I think that's why his friends are so near and dear.